Amen. Welcome to Trinity United Presbyterian Church on Sunday, November 10th, 2024. It's just some quick announcements, and you can find all these announcements in your bulletin, but just to highlight a few, the annual Thanksgiving potluck takes place on November 24th after worship, so instead of instead of uh, coffee hour, uh, we will be having this potluck. As well, um, I just wanted to note that our Christmas candlelight tour to Nemecolon Castle takes place on Saturday, December 14th, and I believe that we're eating or meeting at Pacey's beforehand before uh, we go there. And lastly, the Madrigal um, Feast is Friday, December 6th, as well as Saturday, December 7th. And just a question, to get tickets for this, you have to go online, use the QR code. Are there tickets sold at the door? There are no tickets sold at the door. So if this is something you wanna go to or be a part of, you must uh, use the QR code or go online. That concludes this morning's announcements. Our liturgist this morning is Elder Susan Fox. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you have made us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Give us purity of heart with strength and purpose as we serve others and worship you. Join me in the prayer of confession. 
Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the desires of our own hearts. We have not been loyal, even though you have asked us to be. We confess that we have willingly made choices that go against your will. We admit that our focus is not always on you. We cry out to you with honest confession. Please pause in silence as we think through what we all just said aloud. Amen. Because you restore those who are penitent according to your promises in Christ Jesus, we are free from the yoke of sin. Glory be to God. be seated. I don't think we have any children with us uh, in the congregation this morning, but I still wanted to go ahead and do this children's message. So real quick, cell phone. This is something that I, I would it probably be fair to guess that every single person in this room has a, self, has a cell phone, I would just assume. So this morning, the message was recharge. <clears throat> My battery on my cell phone, now my old cell phone, um, it, we had a great relationship. When my first cell phone, our, at first, you know, when I first got it, the battery, I could just be on that thing all day for, geez, hours on end. And it was great. I'd still have 75%, a few hours later, saw 50%. Well, anyway, by the end of that relationship, I could maybe have my phone unplugged for about an hour and then it would just die on me. Does anyone else have been through that or, or maybe you're going through that right now, that kind of relationship? I apologize. Um, so something that's important. Now I have a new cell phone now, so it's like, it, it's excellent. We're, we're in the honeymoon uh, phase right now and it, it, I plug it in, it charges in like a half hour. It's good all day. But if you have a cell phone that maybe it dies after only an hour or two, what do you have to do to make sure it's, you know, back up and running? Yeah, you recharge it. You have to recharge it. Um, I want to connect that idea with our relationship with Christ. When it comes to our relationship with Christ and just being human beings, we are going to get tired. We are going to have to go through things, and it's going to wear us out. It's going to deplete our battery. And that's why it's so important as human beings to recharge, to rest. So as Christians, we believe this to be the, uh, the same as well. Uh, for Christians, we are to recharge. Now, in what ways do you think a Christian could go about recharging their batteries? Prayer? Absolutely. Reading scripture. Um, going to church, being with other Christians, other believers. That. Those things can really help um, our relationship with God and recharge our batteries. So here's, here's the important part now. In order for us to recharge our, the, the, the think about plugging in and recharging our phone or plugging in and recharging our faith, something we have to do as Christians is we have to make it a priority. Okay, If you don't make charging your cell phone a priority, you're probably going to end up with a dead phone all the time. Do we know anybody like that that always has a dead phone when you're trying to reach them? Their phone's always turned off or dead. Oh, they're, oh, they're laughing at you, Bill. Sorry. So we need to make it a priority that we are charged up. We need to make it a priority to always be in the Word, to be praying, constant communication with God, coming to church, fellowshipping with other believers. 
It's very important if we want to make sure that we are charged and ready to be the hands and feet of Christ. Amen.
Let us pray for illumination. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The first lesson today comes from the Old Testament, the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had both lived there for about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husband, Naomi and her Moabite daughters-in-law. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had had consideration for his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. The second lesson is from the New Testament, the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Concerning treasures, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The sound eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Serving two masters. No one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Susan, for reading this morning's scripture. So today being the 10th of November, we find ourselves, we are a few weeks away from Thanksgiving. And after Thanksgiving, we move into the Advent season. So this is really a, a, a time of anticipation. Advent's a wonderful season, isn't it? I love Advent. It's one of my fa favorite times of year. It prepares us for Christmas, but also something really beautiful about Advent. Really, it sets the stage to prepare us for the Lenten season as well. But as I approach um, the holiday season, as, as some call it, um, <clears throat> we'll start to hear you know, the season. Uh, it will start to come into our area, as in we'll, see, we'll hear it in forms of Christmas music. I was driving the other day, and I turned on a station, and guess what? They were blasting Christmas music. Is, is anyone like that? Do, do we have any of the uh, kind of people here who already have their Christmas tree set up? Anybody like, oh, uh, okay. We have, we have one, one brave enough to admit it. Okay, we all celebrate in different ways. But no, this is the time of year where that stuff starts to come around, the music. Um, I was just talking to Brett about this. Starbucks, they get their... Their, their holiday drinks at Starbucks, you know, the good kind, the kind that has probably your daily intake and calories in just one, in just one drink, okay, that starts to come around. But this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing an Advent message by any means, so that's not what I'm doing this morning, but I just want us to take a quick look at ourselves, and I want us to direct our thoughts to a question, and it will connect a little bit with what I was saying. The question is, to whom are we loyal? Admittedly, 
as we approach these months, our schedules will start to get busy. And something I want to encourage is just because um, you are busy, maybe with Thanksgiving plans, don't forget about the one that provides the things that you're to be thankful for. Or just because you're preparing for Christmas and that fills your schedule, don't forget to whom this season is about. So again, this isn't um, going to be um, an Advent message, but this morning is really, it's a message about loyalty as, as Thanksgiving approaches, as Christmas approaches. Where's our loyalty at during those months? This morning, we are going to explore the concept of loyalty. And I will be talking about how it's not just enough for us to say that we are loyal, for true loyalty requires more than just words. If you have your Bibles, let us open up to one of my favorite books of the Bible, Ruth. The Old Testament book of Ruth is one of only two books in the entire Bible to be named after a woman. Can anybody guess what the other book is? Yeah, Esther, another one of my favorites. But yes, Ruth and Esther. Um, for this morning, we'll be spending time focusing on the first 18 verses of Ruth chapter 1. And when we, start, when we first start reading Ruth um, chapter 1, we find out some things. To set, so let's set the scene this morning. Ruth chapter 1, we find out that there is a severe famine in the land of Judah. So a, na- uh, a man by the name of Elimelech moves from his home in Bethlehem and he moves to the land of Moab, a land that's east of the, um, east of the Dead Sea, um, which with, had a lot of hostility in the area. When traveling to Moab, he brings his wife, Naomi. Okay, Naomi's going to be an important figure in today's conversation. Uh, Naomi, and he brings his two sons with him as well. So after this, some things happen. So after they move to Moab, some things happen. Elimelech, he dies. Okay? So when he dies, that leaves Naomi a widow. Also during this time, the two sons, um, they would get married to Moabite women. And then after that, eventually, uh, those two sons would die. So that would leave Naomi a widow and leave her with only her two daughter-in-laws, okay? So is everyone still with me on that? I know that sounds like the young and the restless or something, but I promise all that comes out of the Bible. A lot going on. So now that we have the background information, let us read Ruth chapter 1, and we are going to read first 6 through 9. When Naomi heard... In Moab, that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughter-in-law, uh, daughter-in-laws prepared to return home from there. With her two daughter-in-law, uh, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her d- two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home, May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud. So we learn here that Naomi, she decides to return to her home. Remember, she's not from Moab. She she went there because of the famine. Um, But her daughter-in-laws, they are from this land. And this is why Naomi gives gives them her blessing. She says, go your own way. You you, You can remain here. This is your home. So when you jump to verse 14 and 15, it says, At this they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother in law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi. Your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. We learn here that Orpah, not, not, um, that Orpah decides to go her own way, but it says that Ruth clung 
to Naomi. Ruth clung to her mother-in-law, which I'm happy to hear that I'm not the only one that does that. So, talking about loyalty a little bit more this morning. Here's our, our key verses, okay? So these, these are the most important words um, that we're going to read this morning. Ruth 1, 16 through 18. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So what we read here, uh, this is such an amazing act of loyalty, not just by a woman in the Bible. This is one of the greatest acts of loyalty by anybody in the Bible. Ruth was so loyal to Naomi that she told her, I'm going wherever you're going, and your people, they're going to be my people. And then I love what she says at the end, and your God will be my God. Talk about loyalty. If you read this four-chapter book in its entirety, you will find that Ruth's loyalty was rewarded, without a doubt. Eventually, when reading, you would find that uh, she ends up moving with Naomi from Moab to Judah, and she's working a field um, that's owned uh, by a man named Boaz, who just so happened to be a relative of Naomi. And he was also a family redeemer. And the story would go, now this sounds a little lifetime or hallmark here, but Ruth and Boaz, they would fall in love, and they would have a son named Obed. And Obed would have a son by the name of Jesse. And then Jesse would have a son by the name of, anybody remember? Any guesses? Yeah, I heard heard it somewhere in there. Have a son by the name of David, King David. So when you think about it, Ruth, who's not even you know, from Israel, ends up being a part of the line of King David. And eventually, if you go down that line a little further, who else would she be connected to? Yeah, Jesus. And I think due in part to her loyalty. If it wasn't for her loyalty to Naomi, she would not have been in that position. There's so much um, that we could find by, by reading. There's so much theology within the book of Ruth. Uh, we could look at things such as um, her being an outsider and then being welcomed in, or we could focus on Boaz being a redeemer, um, like Christ is our redeemer. Um, but for this morning, there is something to be said about remaining loyal. Remaining loyal even in times of struggle, even when life seems difficult, even when it's hard to get out of bed, being loyal. When I read about Ruth's loyalty to Naomi, I also think about how Ruth was such a positive influence on Naomi. Because if you read uh, Ruth chapter 1, 20 through 21, these are, I'm going to read, these are Naomi's words here. It says, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me, Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So we read here, Naomi was bitter. She was bitter about everything that had happened to her. Understandably so. She moves with her, her husband <clears throat> from Judah to a land of hostility in Moab. And while she's there, she loses everything. Her husband dies. Her sons die. And she's left basically alone with just her daughter, daughter-in-laws. She loses everything. But even though there was such bitterness that existed... Ruth stayed with her. 
Ruth walked beside her. It's so beautiful. We have anybody like that in our life we can think of? Maybe somebody that we just love so much, but maybe they're a little bitter, maybe a little unpleasant at times to be around. But for whatever reason, we stick by them, we walk with them. Earlier I said it's not enough just to say you're loyal. But why is that? Well, anyone can say anything, okay? Anyone can say anything. Benjamin Franklin once said, <clears throat> a, well, a well done is better than a well said, end quote. A well done is better than a well said. Um, I'm more interested in what you do, not so much what you say. So here's our challenge as we head into um, this holiday season or Advent, whatever you want to call it. Um, I want to challenge us, including myself, to do what I call a self-inventory. When I was in college, um, I worked for a retail store, and at times they would have what they called in, uh, inventory week. And during uh, inventory week, you, they would have people that would come in from around the nation, and they would, uh, they would do inventory on every single item in the store. They'd have their little, little scanner guns, beep, 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 and they would scan every single item. Now, when they do that, the purpose is for them to take inventory of everything that they have in their store. And by doing an inventory, a store can know, um, they can know what's selling, they can know what's not selling. Doing an inventory helps a store um, to know where they're putting their focus. They can see what's working. They can see what's not working. And the hope is that, you know, by taking an inventory, it will help them with making future well-thought-out calculated decisions on, um, on how they should sell or what they should sell. The same is true for us doing a self-inventory. As Christians, when we do a self-inventory, we are looking at things such as, where are we putting our focus? Also, we're looking at Okay, what's working in our lives? And also, we're looking at what are some of the things that are not working in our lives? We're doing all this so we can make the best decisions possible for our life. We're getting rid of the excess waste to make room for what God desires. The hope of doing a self-inventory is that we are to, one, make sure that our loyalty lies with Christ, and two, we are identifying, what val or we are identifying the values that we should have that connect with Christ. We're looking at things to see what's necessary, to see what's unnecessary. In, my, in uh, my office up top here in the church, the second floor, um, I'm one of those people where if I have a cluttered or messy office, I can't think. Anybody else like that? Um, I just, if I have a lot of mess, papers everywhere, things out of, out of sort, I can't function. I can't think. Now, some people might be the exact opposite where <laughs> that's how they live. That's how they thrive. Uh, for me, not so much. So that's why I literally put on my schedule um, every so often to have a, um, a room clean out where I just get rid of papers I don't need or things that are old or reorganized just so I can stay focused when I'm in that room. That's a little bit of a self-inventory. Okay, what do I need here and what do I not, or what do I not need? Doing a self-inventory with our faith, it's kind of the same thing. It helps us to see where our loyalty's at. What do we see as important? Also, it helps us to ask the question, does our loyalty lie with Christ? Is Christ number one in our life? Is our relationship with Christ? Is it the most important thing? In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, we read about many things that Jesus was teaching. Jesus teaches in 19 through 21, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, 
where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I watched the video recently, um, and it was talking about uh, what happens after we die, what happens after we pass. And it it talked about things such as um, the position that we work in our job, it gets replaced fairly quickly. Also talks about how um, all of our stuff, all of our belongings, mostly all of them get thrown away or they're given to somebody else who who eventually throws it away. Uh, This video also highlighted how the things we work so hard to acquire and attain vanish in such a short amount of time. Money, money is just one of those things. Um, Money is something that really can challenge our loyalty to Christ. Uh, Money is something that can corrupt us because it's something that some may struggle with. Uh, We can never get enough of it. We always desire more, or we like the security um, that it brings us. But just a reminder, uh, the words of Jesus I just read teach that our treasures on earth will fade. And for this reason, having money is number one in your life. And this is just one of many examples you could use. Um, having money being number one in your life, it will vanish one day. Its worth is really not anything. For this reason, placing, our, placing Christ as number one in our life, making sure that Christ is where our loyalty lies, that's something that's forever, something that do- doesn't just vanish. Remember, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where our loyalty lies, that will influence us the most. So with tomorrow being Veterans Day, um, I am reminded of, of the idea of lo- loyalty. We talk about the sacrifice and the loyalty of many men and women who have served in our country and have served in the country we live in. Because of that, many freedoms that we, are, that we have and we're blessed with. It's because of that loyalty that we celebrate a day such as Veterans Day. We often sometimes, we live in a country and we are so blessed. We are the most free country in the world. Often we focus mostly on the negatives so much that we ignore the positives. Um, And there is no doubt that at times the United States has struggled and we still have areas we struggle with and need to improve. But I don't want us to forget about our blessings. I don't want us to forget about how our country was founded upon Christian beliefs. The founding documents of our country, they were with, they were no doubt, they were influenced by Christianity. The Declaration of Independence identifies the source of all authority and rights to who, do you know? To their creator. The creator has all authority. And that all the rights we have, they are not man-made, but they are God-given. So, at the uh, Constitutional Convention in the 18th century, okay, there were 55 delegates for this convention. And I want to read out some of these numbers here. Of those 55 delegates, 28 of them were Episcopalians. Eight of them were Presbyterians. Woohoo, second place. Seven of them, Congregationalists. Two of them were Lutherans, two Dutch Reformed, two Methodists, and two of them were Roman Catholics. So 93% of the delegates were members of Christian churches. God 100% influenced the founding of this country. Founding Father Patrick Henry wrote that it cannot be emphasized too clearly and too often that this nation was founded not by religionalists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. End quote. What a foundation to have. What a place to put our loyalty in Christ. Martin Luther is attributed to saying, quote, where the battle rages, 
there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. I ask the question today, where is our loyalty? And I want to say that our loyalty, our loyalty needs to be on God. And our loyalty has to be God above all. Our loyalty to God needs to be above our money, our investments, our jobs, our hobbies, our political parties, our president. Our loyalty needs to be above all of those to God. It needs to be Jesus Christ that we are serving most faithfully and most loyally. For where our treasure is, our heart will be also. And what we value most will have the highest influence and it will be what we, lo- we are loyal to. So our final question is, does God have your, fi- your, your, your ultimate loyalty? Let us pray. Father, when, when I think about loyalty, I also can't help but to think about all the times in which I was not loyal to you. I can't help but think about all the times in which I have placed my focus or my desires, those things or places or whatever that were not of you, and how I've had pursuits, God, that was opposite of your will. I thank you, God, that for reeling me back in lovingly and helping me, God, so that my heart was placed on you above all. It's so, off, it's so easy, God, for us to look at something like I just mentioned, whether it's our, our, our politics, our finances, or whatever, and we looked at those things for security. And God, we know that those things do not bring security. Those things do not bring peace. But true peace only comes from you. God, I pray that as Christians, that we would recognize that and that we would commit ourselves to being loyal to you and then being your hands and feet and living as yours in this world. Thank you for all that you have done for us, Jesus. Thank you for loving us and thank you for even when we're not loyal, for still desiring us and loving us and wanting to have a relationship with us. We thank you, we trust you, and we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hymn number 170, The Lord's My Shepherd, I'll Not Want.
You may be seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and we will silently pray for the names on our prayer lists. Lord, in prayer this morning, we lift up Bridget, Harry and Dorothy, Randy, Dory, Sophia, Nadina, Arch, Candy, Claudia, Susan, and Sandy, and Francis. God, they need help. There is hurt. There is sickness. There is, there is family, God, that's hurting as well. And we pray that you please would be with each of them. Help them, God, to lean on you and to lean on their other fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Let your love be felt even through challenging circumstance. And we pray that, they got, that God, there is a sense of peace in their life, even though these things are going on. We thank you and we trust you, and we lift all these up to you, praying the way you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen now is the time we give to god our tithes and our offerings
Lord, we give, the, we give these gifts to you as a sign of our loyalty, praying that they would be used, God, to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. To what or to whom is our loyalty? It takes more than just saying something. It's doing something, showing something. We say that we are Christians. So how are we Christians in more ways than just saying we are? This, this week, let us go out and let's remember that. What are we doing? Let's stay faithful. Let's find new ways to be faithful, new ways to be loyal to Christ. Because when we find new ways to be loyal to Christ, we can grow closer to him. Not only that, but it's just so peaceful. There's so, there's so much happiness to be found, so much joy to be found. Let's go enjoy and let's see Christ and be completely loyal to Christ. Amen. Amen.